Welcome everyone to part two of our three-part program on new Yiddish and Klezmer music today. My name is Mark Kligman. I'm director of the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience at UCL, UCLA. And I also bring you greetings from our partner, Yivo, and we'll turn things over in just one second to tonight's host. We have a third part of our program, which will be at this same time on Thursday night, December 15th, or Thursday, depending on what time zone you're in. And we will talk about a wonderful new opera. It's an old opera that's been done anew. Uh, opera is called Basheva done this last summer at the Ashkenaz Festival. And we hope you can join us for that program as well. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Alex Weiser, who's the Director of Public Programs at YIVO, in addition to being a Pulitzer Prize winning composer. And Alex and I have partnered on putting this program together. And without further ado, Alex, we look forward to today's program. Uh, thanks so much, Mark. And um, on behalf of YIVO, I'll just add that we're so thrilled to be co-sponsoring this series um, and shedding light on all the wonderful work that everyone's doing out there in Yiddish land. Um, and so I want to get started with um, inviting everyone. We've got a really um, illustrious panel today, and I would like to invite everyone to spend, you know, five, six, seven minutes introducing yourself and the organization um, slash festival that you're representing. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about it and let us know how you see it fitting into the Yiddish music and cultural landscape. Um, and I will call on you one by one, um, just in the order that you're on my screen. And Pete, you're you're up first. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, first of all, thanks, Milken Center at UCLA. Thanks, Eva, for putting this together. We're really excited and excited to be with my colleagues, my festival running colleagues from across the world. Uh, so I... Uh, I don't like to say I run. I don't even like to say I coordinate. I don't know what I, I'm, I consider myself the chief apologist for Yiddish New York. And as you can see, December 24th through 29th, it's a, I'll take any opportunity to plug this festival, even this little hex thing I have here, uh, but it's coming up really soon. So, and it's going to be a great time. We're going to have high, it's going to be a hybrid program. I'll talk a little bit about that. So you can enjoy it anywhere in the world online, or you can come to New York city and, be at the Museum for Jewish Heritage and uh, enjoy it in person. So um, Yiddish New York, we're in our eighth year. Uh, we see ourselves as the kind of the successor festival to Klez Camp, uh, which ran for 30 years in the Catskills. I'm wearing a proud to wear a Klez Camp sweatshirt from 1995, actually courtesy of Michael Alpert. Uh, and Klez Camp for so many of us was just such a you know, really a, a transformative festival, a transformative learning and uh, immersion experience. I met my wife at Klez Camp and uh, a lot of most of my friends. So uh, when that, um, and so a big salute to Henry Sapoznik and uh, Adrian Cooper was very involved in getting that festival going for Ye on the Evo side at the very beginning. Uh, but, um, so we're really saw ourselves when, when Klez Camp announced that it was going to do its last festival in 2014, a bunch of us who had been going for years jumped up and said, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? So we got together and voila, uh, Yiddish New York was formed. Um, and I think what we've tried to do is, um, Klez Camp is, was wonderful uh, it was great to have an immersion experience, similar to what Klez Canada gives you, similar to what I think Yiddish Summer Weimar gives you. Um, but uh, at the same time, you know, we also saw the opportunity when when carrying it on to say, well, what if we didn't do it at some hotel in the Catskills, but put it in the middle of New York City, where we could draw on the amazing resources of the city, you know, the amaz amazing population of scholars and musicians and artists of all sorts of media that that are residing here and so i could i could i could tell you what the what we say our mission is on the website but basically it's to unleash yiddish on new york city during a concentrated period of time coming up in december and um so we you know because we're in new york i think we 
you know, it's just amazing. We can call upon like dozens and dozens of scholars and other artists to, um, you know, be, be our presenters and, and work with us. And we can partner with a whole range of different uh, partner organizations like YIVO. This year, we're going to be hosted by the Museum of Jewish Heritage. For the past seven years, we were at the uh, the 14th Street Y, which is a great partner, and we do programs all around the city. So, um, and, uh, you know, I, I think what's exciting is it has a chance to really grow into something very big. Um, we don't do a heck of a lot of coordinated curation. It's it's basically a bunch of, we have like seven or eight curators and then a whole bunch of other people who are constantly pitching programs. And so the one rule I have in, in trying to make it all happen is basically assume I'm going to say yes to everything, unless there's a really good reason why I can't say yes to any idea. So that's what we try and do is we try and, you know, solicit as many great ideas as we can and say yes to as many of them as humanly possible. Wonderful. Um, that's a great introduction and we'll get into everything I'm sure more uh, during this time. Um, Avia, you're the next person in my uh, order here. Thanks, Alex, and Shalom Aleichem, everyone. Thanks for the invitation to be here today. Um, my name is Avia Moore, and I'm the Artistic Director of CLES Canada. Uh, CLES Canada is a Montreal-based organization, uh, and we are dedicated to fostering Yiddish culture, both in Montreal and around the world. And as Many of you know Montreal is another um, key site of Yiddish culture in the world and has been historically. Um, but today I'll mostly be referring to our summer retreat, which is our central, our best known program. Um, but we do have year round activities as well. So we're now planning for our 28th summer, which is pretty exciting. Um, our first summer retreat was in 1996. And our summer retreat is an immersive and interdisciplinary program of hands-on workshops, talks, discussions, concerts, shows, social events, community. It's intergenerational, it's international, it's interdenominational. Um, and the space we create is held at a summer camp in the Laurentian Mountains. So the natural environment has also become a really integrated part of that experience and time next to and in the lake is really an important part for our participants. Um, our participants range from um, professional artists to artists who are just picking up an instrument or a paintbrush for the first time um, to folks who want to come and listen to talks rather than take participatory classes to families for whom it's their week of vacation. Um, and it's a pretty special, it's a pretty special place. Um, at this point, I believe uh, we are the only sort of full week long residential program on the Yiddish scene as in residential in which everybody comes and stays on site together in shared accommodation. Um, and clearly also, as Pete said, modeled on um, and inspired by uh, Klez Camp um, in, its, in its founding. So in terms of how we relate to the Yiddish world, uh, we think of ourselves as part of an ecosystem of Yiddish events and Yiddish organizations. Um, we are, I think all of, all of our organizations are um, so strong on their own, but we are um, an incredible ecosystem together. And so we intentionally build relationships with all the other, pro as many other programs as we can. We have a very close relationship with Yiddish New York. Um, we've collaborated with Yiddish Summer Weimar. We collaborate with Ashkenaz here in Canada, with uh, Chutzpah Festival in Vancouver, um, and, and far more. Um, and that I think that really adds richness to um, our program and I hope to the ecosystem overall. Um, there's a lot more I can say, but maybe I'll, I'll stop there and, and save it for the other questions. That's a great introduction. Thank you so much. Lisa, you're up next in my order of my screen. 
Thanks, Alex. And again, thanks to everybody for having, having me on as representing the Yiddish Book Center and our festival, which is Yidstock, the Festival of New Yiddish Music. Um, the center, for those of you who know us, which I hope is everybody in the audience, um, was established in 1980 with the mission of rescuing Yiddish books, which we have done. We've rescued over a million and a half. We have digitized them and made them available for free and redistributed them. And it's ongoing work. Uh, we continue to receive them in the last year or so in just unbelievable waves. We launched a lot of educational programs uh, as well as public programs. And in 2012, Susan Bronson, our executive director, had the idea that let's think about doing a festival. Over the years, the center had uh, had hosted concerts here and there at the you know at the facility at our Amherst headquarters. But she thought to bring it all under the umbrella of one large festival. So many of our members um, and folks who drop by the center are scattered around the globe. So this gave them an opportunity to come to the center and experience a lot of music and other aspects of our work. So we launched that in 2012. It was a two-day festival. It was um, beyond sold out. I never thought I would be chasing people out the door or um, keeping people from scalping tickets, as it were, <laughs> to get in. So safe to say it was a really great idea and a very fun venture for us. Um, it's grown now to be a four-day festival. It includes six concerts and a lot of talks, a dance workshop and a klezmer workshop. And it really engages with both the artists and the audience. It's been a really wonderful opportunity for the center to facilitate what I call cross-pollination for the musicians. Um, it obviously draws on aspects of Yiddish culture, which is what we're all about as well, and um, and really furthers those conversations. We've been able to bring amazing musicians from around the world, one of whom is in the audience I can see in the gallery, and maybe others. Um, and they are at the center for three to four days. We have folks who come for the full four days of the festival, and that kind of tells you the story of Yidstock. It's got a great name. When I was doing the marketing for this, I have to say, I loved the whole idea of something that mimicked Woodstock. Um, and it's been a really fun venture and continues to grow and allows us to program under one umbrella for the concerts. Wonderful. Thank you, Lisa. And finally, Alan. Hi, everybody. It's uh, 9 p.m. here, uh, where I am, which is at the moment in Cyprus. It's really a pleasure to be here and an honor to be here uh, with my colleagues and also with so many people who are interested in this subject from as artists and, and uh, cultural activists and scholars and so forth. It's a, a, a wonderful community. Um, I'm the Artistic Director of Yiddish Summer Weimar. I don't know whether my colleague Andreas Schmidtkes is here, but for a few years now he has been acting as curator. I'm looking, I'm scanning around. I don't see him, but I, I maybe he'll join us later. Um, the mission of Yiddish Summer Weimar, which is located in Weimar, Germany, has evolved quite a lot over the years. Um, it started off actually in 1998 as a four-day workshop. Um, the students who came to that workshop were very enthusiastic about it. Um, asked for uh, us to do it the following year, turn into a week. Um, and then when they asked for it to come back again the following year, we thought, well, my consideration from the beginning, actually, Yiddish Summer of Weimar, I was familiar with, had been to um, many, many editions of, of Kles Camp, and also I've been involved with Kles Canada and also with London Kles Fest. And, what I felt was really um, needed in the community was a place where the teachers could have a serious exchange with each other about what they were doing and what they were learning, because there was a little bit of a tendency, especially in the beginning, for us to work in parallel with each other. And we would kind of only find out at lunch or at dinner what we had been doing and um, really have a chance to exchange ideas. I remember one particular time at one of the festivals where I was I was listening to a lunch conversation and two students said, well, this is what I learned today in my class. And the other one said, well, I learned exactly the opposite. And I know that the two teachers were actually right next to each other. 
And I thought, now this is interesting that there isn't an opportunity for an exchange of content on that level. So originally the idea of Yiddish Summer of Weimar was let's invite a small group of people each year, a different group of people each year to come together and by teaching together in a kind of a seminar-like atmosphere with a group of people who were also pretty deeply involved and could follow what was going on, really make some progress in some of the subjects that we're interested in. So it was really like a seminar. Um, what happened is that in order, so the first year the focus was, I would say, mostly on instrumental music, and then some of the vocalists said, well, we really like this model, we'd like to have a week for ourselves too. So I said, okay, well, let's expand to two weeks so that we can still be a community in the second week. And then dancers said, well, we would really like to have a week for ourselves too. So we thought, well, then let's put a third week. And basically year to year, we grew horizontally rather than vertically, because especially at the beginning, there was this very strong conviction that I wanted each week to be a kind of its own world where artists and scholars would come together um, and really stay focused. Um, so that means basically at Yiddish Summer Weimar, you arrive at nine o'clock in the morning and you don't go home until after midnight and you're together with everybody pretty much all day. Um, so it's very, very immersion, very, very intense and lots of opportunities for both formal and informal learning. I'm a big believer in informal learning, too. Um, that original mission, which, let's say, had two parts to it, let's call it kind of research and also teaching, dissemination, uh, gained a third mission around 2012 when we began to add um, a festival week. So until then, we had been really just workshops, which, be, which began the week with a faculty concert and ended with a workshop concert, a participants concert. 2012, we kind of joined an initiative on the part of the city and also the, the state of Turingia to really um, um, increase more of a kind of a festival atmosphere um, in Weimar. And we joined that with a festival week. Then we became a presenter. But we were already interested in presenting things that were relevant to the topic that we were working on. So I should mention that every year I have a fundamentally transcultural understanding of what Yiddish is, what Yiddish culture is, what culture in general is, but, but especially relevant is Yiddish culture, especially in the context of Germany maybe and Europe, where there's a tendency to think of Yiddish culture as something that was very hermetically enclosed and something that was wiped out completely in the Second World War and that was always in a ghetto and many, many misconceptions. Um, exactly the opposite of, I think, what most of us now understand about Yiddish land as being something which was kind of like an amazing capillary system that went through the entire body of the world and which, um, of course, suffered terrible, terrible catastrophes, including the Holocaust in the 20th century, but is still very, very much alive. So, my, excuse me, my conviction was to try to bring um, that kind of a living atmosphere, a living transnational, transcultural atmosphere to um, this event in, in Weimar. So each year we have either for one or for two years at a time, we have a specific focus. Um, for two years, our focus was called the other Israel. Then at a certain period of time, two years, we had a focus called Ashkenaz one and two. Um, we had a focus called the other Europeans, which looked into the relationship between Lautari, primarily Roma musicians and Klezmorim, primarily Yiddish musicians in the former area of Bessarabia. And um, last year and this year, for example, we're focused on Yiddish music and musicians vis-a-vis -vis the Ottoman Empire. And we bring together scholars and artists and practitioners to really um, still kind of dig into a topic together and see what we can create through uh, like creating new Yiddish and related um, culture, uh, which is historically informed. Um, and then the fourth stage where I would say we've reached a kind of mature identity is um, when we said, OK, we want to not only um, have the first three pillars of our of our mission, namely uh, research and transmission and um, presentation, but also the creation, like actively support the creation of of new Yiddish culture. And so for the last five or six years, an important part of our festival has been that we have um, been producing um, entirely new projects um, through Yiddish Summer Weimar. Um, some of them are, are for existing artists, some of them are youth projects that we do in collaboration with universities in Europe and also in the United States and in, and in Israel. 
And we very, very much like to uh, try to give these uh, projects a life after Yiddish Summer Weimar by collaborating with festivals like Ashkenaz and, and, and bringing these projects all around the world. Some of the people who have done projects in that context are Josh Woletsky, um, uh, Amit Weisberg, uh, uh, the, um, Sasha Luria, Svet Kundish. I wrote a musical based on in that context and so forth. So here we are at this point. Um, and I would say we have a mature identity, which is this fourfold, uh, fourfold uh, mission. Um, and we have people coming to us also, I think, as Avia said, and I think it's very typical in a way of these international events. We have uh, intergenerational and interconfessional um, people of every conceivable identity and being maximally inclusive is extremely important to, to who we are and what we stand for. Thank you. Thank you all for these wonderful introductions. Um, dovetailing on what Alan was just speaking about, about the audience of um, Yiddish Summer of Weimar and how it grew from this focus on practitioners to um, you know, being more forward, uh, face outward facing with a festival component. Um, you all spoke about, a little bit about this, but I wonder if you could speak further about who your audience is um, or who your different audiences are and also who you'd like your, who is your future audience? Who's out there that you're hoping will um, start coming to each of your festivals? And um, we can just go as, as the spirit moves you. Pete, you're, you're muted. Sorry about that. For Yiddish New York, I mean, I think of different concentric circles or overlapping circles, things like that. I mean, there's the, and there's many of them. Um, and again, we're, you know, we are kind of carrying a torch from a festival that was around for 30 years and really actually fostered all these festivals in one way or another or inspired them. Um, but I, I think to, what we what we're trying to do is take that take that creative impulse that was in the Catskills at Klez Camp, put it in New York City, and use that to expand the population of practitioners, of audiences, of people who are interested either through scholarship, arts, activism, you know, in all those ways. Um, so, I, it's a really complex demographic, but you know, we certainly see a lot of outreach. I mean, I used to, for a long time, I didn't live in, in New York City. And I would go to these UJA national conventions because that's what you did when you were in 20 something living in a small Jewish community like Buffalo, New York or something to meet people. And I would ask, do you guys know what klezmer means? And I was surprised, maybe only like a quarter of the people at these things knew the word klezmer, what it was. And so I think there's huge opportunity. I mean, even in New York City to just expand the knowledge of Yiddish arts, Yiddish culture, um, in all these communities. We have special out, we try to do special outreach to the um, population of former Soviet Jews. We try and do special outreach to the, uh, you know, folks in the Hasidic community or or the folks who are off the derech who have kind of left the uh, Hasidic community to one extent or another. Um, and there's just, you know, and then, you know, also, you know, outside of the Jewish community, too. So there's uh, there's lots of interest in folks who just like great music, like great cultural experiences. You know, we're trying to, over time, build Yiddish New York into a cultural tourism experience. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity to do that. It's, um, it's sort of Yiddish New York fills is an easy way to fill a, an obvious uh media story that comes around every year what do jews do during christmas yiddish new york here's the i mean that's the answer it's sort of a built-in answer to a story that every media outlet does some kind of story on every year usually not usually those those uh stories tend to be pretty shallow but uh you know it's also an opportunity for us you know the the culture makers uh to um you know, to enrich that discussion and dialogue and, you know, get the word out about what we do. I'm happy to build on that um, because I think like Yiddish New York, well, like all of our organizations, really, we have uh, overlapping 
a really complex audience, complex and overlapping audience. Um, Clez Canada's summer retreat, I would say, is one of the most truly intergenerational uh, spaces I've ever experienced. Um, at a typical retreat, our participants range from a, a year old or less to 90 plus. Um, and, um, and we have a scholarship program, which is a belo internationally beloved scholarship program, which has run for over 20 years, um, uh, which is the Azrieli Scholarship Program. And it brings 50 to 100 scholarship participants depending on the size of the retreat, but some years 50, some years 100, and anywhere in between, um, between the ages of 16 and 35 to our retreat. And it's done that for more than 20 years now. And so because of that, um, because of that program, we have a core, a real core, which has over the years also, um, uh, become the teachers and the the leaders of um, of festivals all all around the world, and it's it's really incredible, you know, to watch uh, watch this demo. I think in pedagogy okay. for their. Um, Oh, you just cut out oh. a little bit of via. Oh, sorry. That's no, okay. Yeah. Where did I cut out? You were saying it's been incredible to. It's incredible to watch uh, uh, this demographic um, study around the world at these different institutions, and then transition into um, artists and teachers in for the in their own um, in their own way. Um, I'm sure my colleagues here will agree that that's really fulfilling. And, and I will say I represent that demographic. I came out of Clez Canada's scholarship program. That was my entry into the Yiddish world. Um, and from there went to all of these other programs. Um, so so this, over, this overlapping rich audience, um, I think is really key to who we are are and who the community is. And it's very important to me that as we, um, as we envision who we are going to be in the future, that we make sure that we are also serving those different overlapping communities. Um, who else might I hope would join our audience? I think it's a great question. I would love to see more Canadians join at CLES Canada. Um, it's a very international um, retreat and we love that. Um, but in some ways we're better known outside of Canada than we are in Canada. And I think that that's something we can work on. Um, we're doing more engagement with our immediate surroundings in Quebec, which has of course its own amazingly rich cultural traditions, music, language, um, dance forms, and how, you know, how can we interact with our neighboring culture, as Alan is talking about with these neighboring cultures um, in the European context, right? We're in a rich cultural context of our own, and we want to explore what that means for us rooted in Montreal. Um, I think we're also, I envision us leaning into um, leaning into CLES Canada as a, like we already are an educational and a laboratory space, but I really see us um, developing that, uh, that residency space, that create, creative lab space. Um, it's these immersive environments are such a rich environment for um, the creative spark, right? It happens anyway, but I want to open up more spaces where um, uh, artists from around the world can come with specific projects that they want to work on and use that creative energy to, um, to enrich their work, right? I mean, we have, uh, also we have this uh, faculty full of mentors ready to, 
to give feedback or to to enrich that um, that uh, that space. So I see that as also another potential audience for for who we are. Yeah, I I can speak a little bit about Yidstock. Um, our audience is fairly broad, but I would say it really skews from teens and mostly college students, including our alumni all the way up to, you know, 90 plus. I find that a lot of times there um, are families that come with two, you know, one or two generations, which is kind of nice. And there's a shared experience. It always takes place during our Steiner Summer Yiddish program. So this is um, the a cultural component for the summer students in Yiddish. Um, as well, which is really nice. Um, and, you know, we bring people again, members who make um, kind of an annual pilgrimage trek as it were to the center because it's expanded to four days. Um, I should mention Seth Rogovoy, who's our artistic director. Uh, we've really enhanced the programming so you can spend pretty much the whole day at the center experiencing the concerts and the talks. And that's been an opportunity for different generations to engage in different ways with uh, the material and the, and the music. Also, the same is true um, in terms of providing a place for incubation. I think that that's always been at the core of Yidstock, and I think that that's what makes it so exciting for both the audience as well as the musicians, because one bit of energy feeds off of another. Um, it's not formulaic uh, tours of, you know, the seven great hits of each and eight, every one of the bands. Um, it's always evolving and changing. In terms of you know, who else we would like to expand to? It's a funny question. I mean, it's a great question, but a funny question because I don't think I can answer it. I think we're really happy with the complement of people. Would that we could um, accommodate more people because uh, a lot of stuff <laughs> sells out for our performance hall. Um, but we've really enjoyed a, a very broad range and we have a lot of people who come back year after year um, and, and connect there. It's sort of a bit of a reunion place and space. So in all of the three people who spoke before me, I hear uh, echoes of things that that I would say are true uh, for Yiddish Summer of Weimar too. By the way, we've also intensified our Yiddish language program over the last years there. So there's a very strong Yiddish language uh, component. Um, there's more of a focus, um, not only through Yiddish Summer of Weimar, but through another project we started a couple of years ago where Avia is also uh, taught called Generation J which is really meant to be a youth generation, again, transcultural, extremely diverse um, workshop, creative workshop with um, y new Yiddish culture at its heart. Um, our audiences are quite diverse. Um, I would say that for the people who come to our workshops, it tends to be the case, but this is a generalization, that for let's say the beginning workshops and the intermediate level workshops that that people come from um, Europe because they're just getting interested or just getting started and um, it makes sense for them to go to a festival or less in their backyard for the more advanced workshops people come from all around the world because it's a pretty unique environment to be able to really be there with with a group of 20 or 30 very very advanced people and and spend an entire week working on a subject together. So we have, um, in pre-COVID times, we had as many as 26 different countries represented at Yiddish Summer of Weimar in any given year. Um, it also tends to be that the more advanced workshops, there are more Jewish people in those workshops and uh, the less advanced workshops, the ones that, that sort of attract more, uh, let's say culture tourists or people who are just trying out things are tend to be not so much Jewish audiences um, or participants in general. I also feel very, very strongly, I mean, when, when I began uh, Yiddish Summer Weimar, which was originally called Klezmer Weeks Weimar, by the way, um, I used to you know, call myself the young generation. Um, so we were in those days sort of in our early 40s, 40s somethings, people like, like Michael Alpert and Kurt Bureling and uh, Stuart Brotman, we actually were the band that began Yiddish Summer of Weimar. Um, and there was the new generation that came up, especially from 
the former Soviet Union. This is people like Ilya Shneves, I think he's here. Um, Sasha Luria, I think I've seen her too here. Um, um, Stas Raiko, Mark Kovnatsky, um, uh, Sveta Kundish. Those are people who, who came to Yiddish Summer Weimar, I think, especially when the funding for festivals in places like Moscow and St. Petersburg and so forth collapsed because there was a period of time in the 90s where um, American foundations were, were supporting those, those places. And then at a certain point, I think they began to withdraw that support and people um, in those former Soviet um, Union festivals were saying, well, where do we go now? And Yiddish Summer of Amar was right around the corner and they had met many of the people who were teaching there, people like Michael and, and Adrian and Zalman because they had been to uh, former Soviet Union places. So it was kind of natural for them to come to Yiddish Summer Weimar. And they came initially as students, as scholarship students, and then they became artists in residence. And now they've, you know, they're leading teachers. And um, it's hard to imagine Yiddish Summer Weimar without them. I mean, they're really in the very forefront of Yiddish Summer Weimar and also many other festivals throughout the world. So I do have a, a, a deep wish to attract more young people. And I'm worried about that too, um, because I understand why it was that there was this sort of natural hunger to understand more about Yiddish culture in, let's say, my generation um, in the United States. And 20 years later in this generation that I just named in the former Soviet Union. But I don't see, at least in Europe, I don't see the generation that's behind that one, um, the, the, the young 20 year olds. Um, at least not in the same numbers, um, and maybe not with the same kind of burning curiosity and passion that I saw. Anyway, it seems to me to be that way. Yeah. I have more the feeling actually that that, that um, has shifted to back to North America again. Um, that's something that I'm not sure is true, but based upon the people who have been coming to Yiddish Summer Weimar the last years, I think um, I see a lot of activity coming from North America. So our challenge is how to make it possible for people from North America to afford coming over to Europe. It's obviously much more expensive to come then, the, there than to, to come to a, a North America-based festival. I do see people in, in Europe. I'm also very interested in people who have left the Hasidic community or who, are, who have one foot in, one foot out. There, there are some interesting communities of those people in, in Germany, in Dresden. There's also an interesting phenomenon of several thousand Israelis who have come to Berlin over the last few years to kind of recover uh, part of their cultural heritage that, um, you know, that was suppressed in Israel for the last two generations at least. And um, some of those people run into Yiddish Summer Weimar. We've had actually some amazing developments among young generations um, the Caravan Orchestra, which was led by Leah Schneves for, for several years, um, a project that I did with choirs in Israel, which is called the Kadya Choir, and a number of other youth projects where we really see huge potential among young people in Israel now. Um, so that sort of that famous third generation phenomenon is happening now in Israel. Uh, by the third generation, I mean, you know, this, this phenomenon that a sociologist named Hansen identified years ago Namely, the first generation of immigrants tries to survive in the new culture. The second immigration usually assimilates if it can as completely as possible. And the third generation says, what did we, what did we lose in this process of assimilation and where can we find out you know, what was there before we assimilated? So in any case, I think our mission at Yiddish Summer Weimar is to keep doing what we're doing, but to make it possible for more young people, both Jewish and non, Jewish people to come and and really dive into into this world. Thanks. Wonderful. <clears throat> One of the things I think is so interesting about all these festivals is how it's really not just about the audiences. It's also about the musicians and it's about the you know the people they all have um, you know workshops or classes that are a part of it or that are associated with it. The Yiddish Book Center has the Steiner program at the same time. Um, so it's it speaks to these festivals playing this kind of broader role. It's not just entertainment, it's something different um, or it's it's that and more. And I wonder if you could all speak to that a little bit. How do you see, you know, this kind of broader mission of, of this work, you know, broadly your festival, but also just kind of all this work broadly. And how do you think it fits into 
Jewish culture? You know, we've been talking about it playing a role in this Yiddish world, in the klezmer world, but how about Jewish culture more broadly? <laughs> I, I mean, if I, I might, I mean, uh, go ahead, Lisa. Oh, I, I would just jump in and say, I think that that's really, a lot of the things you touched on, Alex, are really at the core of Yidstock. I know when Seth Rogovoy works on putting together the program, it's, you know, we look at it as a possibility for musicians to incubate work that um, we would like them to have that opportunity. And again, it it infuses a certain energy for the audience as well. A lot of what they'll find is unexpected. So if you can provide that opportunity, that place, that residency, the ability to cross pollinate. When I sometimes explain, you know, a question we get is why the, you know, why the Yiddish Boot Center would put on a Yiddish Klezmer Festival, because it's so in keeping with aspects of Yiddish culture. It was a culture that was broad and global. We're opening a new core exhibit called Yiddish, a global culture, which reflects this. And music, like everything else, evolved with the backdrop of its contemporary culture. It was in reaction to it. So much of Yiddish and modern Jewish culture, you know, borrowed from the various places around the world that it it's place based. It it's it's always evolving. It's a continuum, and I think that that's what the festival is able to provide um, in terms of what it allows for in the evolution and the incubation and the collaborative process for musicians. And that infuses it with a sense of new energy. And you think of Yiddish um, cultural producers, not a phrase I usually love, but I think it explains it, who were young and they were vital and they were creating um, and trying out new things. And I think that that's so much a part of our festival, but I think it's also so much a part of what everybody here is doing. It's allowing for that continuum in a really exciting way. I was going to say, Avia brought up the, the term ecosystem, and that's something I think a lot about is how, uh, you know, how Yiddish New York can be the part, can be a, an important key in inculcating ecosystem, various ecosystems that overlap, you know, and what is a, what is a cultural ecosystem, and an arts ecosystem? And you need audiences, you need, obviously you need performers, you need people who can sort of teach the art form. You need venues, you need, uh, you know, all sorts of things. You need some degree of competition, you know, because that can really drive a lot of wonderful art making, you know, um, and it's sort of a, it's sort of a, um, a, a, a um, not sure the word, but a, a collection of sort of competition and collaboration going hand in hand and in, in uh, fostering, fostering arts, you know, on ongoing uh, self-sustaining arts ecosystem. So I, I really think a lot about that is, you know, how, when we do a program, how, what, what, what's going to be the life of this program after the program itself is over? You know, are the things going to, is there a legacy, programmatic legacy that's going to come out of it? Whatever we do, if it's a particular concert, if it's a, you know, a theater class, if it's a, you know, something we're doing focused on our, our scholarship students, uh, you know, how can how can that have a life of its own after the immediate program takes place, either in inspiring people to continue to work together, work competitively potentially, uh, or what have you? So that's that's something you know. I think that's I always um, I sort of challenge myself and the you know and the curators is how can we make what we're doing have a life that goes beyond what we did. Um. A couple of things to add here that are probably related to each other because they usually are. One, um, I think especially with the immersive programs that we also have an opportunity to, um, to see how our communities are practicing co-creating community in these spaces. Right, that, and that is part of how we relate more broadly to the world and the Jewish world. So um, at, at our summer retreat, I, I look around and I see our participants 
co-creating ways of being together as a Jewish community that is not a singular, not one singular way of being Jewish, not one singular way of identity, but read rather incredibly rich in the diversity of voices that are there. And um, as we learn to play together or to make art together, in, as we learn to work interdisciplinary, um, in, in interdisciplinary ways, we're also sort of practicing and rehearsing and finding our ways through how we, how we are together as people, how we are together as community. And I think that's a really important role that, um, that our program plays. And I will say, I say our program because I want to talk, to talk to my experience at CLES Canada, but I certainly see this happening at other programs. And as Alan said, for instance, I was on part of the team at Generation J for the last couple of programs and saw, very much saw the same thing happening there. Um, and we get many participants who are themselves looking for ways of engaging with their own Jewish identity and looking for new ways or alternative ways of engaging with uh, their Jewishness or their Jewish heritage. Um, um, and they're finding potential within our programs and within community that they didn't necessarily find in other places. But then they're taking that seed and they're taking it back out into their world. So part of what I see us, us doing is actually um, seeding other communities. And maybe th that relates to a critique of some of these festivals, which is that we are centralized, right? You have to travel to Canada. You have to travel to Weimar. You, this is less true in the digital age, of course, but for the in-person festivals, you need to travel to them. And that can be prohibitive in terms of cost, in terms of time. Um, so I see part of our role in being responsible for helping to build communities around the world, right? People come to us and they learn intensively and then they go out to their own local communities and many of them seed these wonderful smaller festivals or smaller community workshops, um, which then bring people back to the larger festivals. And I think part of our role is to support that, that part of the ecosystem. So um, that's very much, um, very much part of how we relate to both the contemporary Jewish world and the Yiddish world. Um, yeah, there's so much, there's so much richness there. Um, and, um, but I, I certainly see us um, as part of that ecosystem rather than um, operating in isolation. I agree with that. Um, I've called Yiddish Summer Weimar um, an, an international learning community, actually, from the beginning as a festival. Uh, I've said we want to be that rather than a shopping mall. Um, we really want to be a place where people come back year after year and where they also go out to other places and where this knowledge is circulating all around the world. Um, I think that in a way, the situation in Germany for Yiddish Summer Weimar is, is significantly different from the festival, uh, the other three festivals which are located in North America, which is that this kind of natural living Jewish, all on the different sides of this complex Jewish identity spectrum that is obvious pretty much to everyone who's grown up in the United States or in Canada, is not at all obvious in a place like Germany. Um, and so for that reason, there's been from the beginning a really deep confrontation with what Jewish identity is, what it isn't, what are cliches about um, on all sides of the identity question. And actually that led to the fact that in 2006, when we created our own not-for-profit organization, I said, let's call it the Other Music um, Foundation, where really the focus is on the idea of otherness. Because what I realized is that many people came to Yiddish Summer of Amr with an idea in their mind, what Yiddish was, what Jewish was. And the first thing they would encounter was something very different from what they thought. 
And that whole process of discovering who am I, who is the other, who are we vis-a-vis -vis one another. I, I, I love Martin Buber as an introduction into this thinking of that, that each of our identity is, is fundamentally um, tied up in the identity of the other people, that we can't define ourselves uh, uh, first as individuals and then make bridges to others, but that we're, we're in a complex from the beginning that includes others. And so we have to deal with this idea of otherness. So the Other Music Academy actually defines, its, uh, defines itself since 2006 as an empowerment center, which is not necessarily about music per se. And music is one of the things that it does. But, it, but the idea of the Other Music Academy is to be really a platform where people from all levels of society can ask deep questions about uh, their, their identities and their creativity and their role in society um, and can do this in a way which empowers them rather than basically just confirms that they should keep their mouth shut if they're not buying something. I mean, the identity as a consumer. Um, which is maybe particularly acute in Weimar because Weimar is sort of flooded in in elite culture, in high culture. You know, you, you walk through Weimar and this is where Goethe walked and Liszt walked and Wagner walked and Nietzsche walked and who am I, you know? It's like now Luke is also nothing, that joke, right? In, uh, in, in Weimar. And so for people who are in Weimar, that question of, well, what's my creative role in culture is a, is a deep question. And we're conscious of the fact that um, literally a 10 minute bus ride away is Buchenwald. And so this is a place where questions of identity got answered in an extremely brutal uh, way. And, and that atmosphere, the potential for answering questions of identity in eliminationist murderous ways is still there. Um, it's also there in North America. We have a constant reminder of it. Um, every time the, the bus with the you know bus to Buchenwald uh, memorial site goes by, which is every 15 minutes, we're reminded of this, you know. Um, and at the same time, as there's this sort of very broad idea, a very broad question of otherness, which has, by the way, led to many different projects. Um, in the Yiddish Summer Weimar, the sort of the learning model of Yiddish Summer Weimar turn into a kind of a, 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 a jumping off point for doing projects about music and improvisation in general and dance improvisation, movement improvisation, um, hand, uh, handcrafts, um, people from various segments of society getting together to build a sailing boat, all kinds of different things that have to do with kind of the creative empowerment of, of, of all kinds of people in society. At the same time that there's this kind of very diverse mission, there's also, interestingly enough, we find ourselves really engaged with trying to convince people that actually Yiddish summer has a home in Germany. Um, Yiddish culture has a home in Germany. Most of you here know that the Yiddish language um, in its early form, which we call Western Yiddish or early Yiddish, grew up in Rhineland, right, in, 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 uh, in German territories, and that Ashkenaz the word itself is the Middle Hebrew word for German speaking territories. So the kind of the fantasy that many, many people have, including myself 20 years ago, that Yiddish is something that comes from Eastern Europe rather than thinking of Yiddish as something which has an extremely important point of formation in Germany itself and that it belongs to Germany. It's not a transplant to Germany, but it's a kind of a homecoming to Germany. That's something that we have to, um, that we're working on. And not only vis-a-vis, -vis, I would say, first of all, not vis-a-vis -vis the non-Jewish community, which is willing to accept it. It's the Jewish community of Germany that has a hard time accepting that because there has, at least for 100 or 200 years, there's been uh, quite a lot of tension between um, German Jewish self-identity and Eastern European Jewish self-identity. And we still feel ourselves very much in the middle of that crucible. It's really fascinating to hear how, you know, in all of these in all these festivals, there is this bigger question of grappling with Jewish identity, um, you know, providing a space to to think through it, um, and along those lines, creating community and creating not not just community, but a kind of artistic and cultural ecosystem. That word has come up a lot, um, and uh, it's a it's a it's a fascinating, important you know uh, work that everyone is doing. Um, and one of the things that also came up a lot is this idea of, of incubation of new work and of supporting um, people creating new work. Um, and I wonder if everyone could speak a little bit about that. You know, um, this is, uh, you know, the question of continuity 
and memory is of course important in any cultural community, but in, in you know, the Jewish community where Zachor is a kind of commandment, a uh, commandment to remember, um, it's, a, it's a very big part of how we think about culture. Um, and yet it's so important and it's so a part of everyone's work here to create new culture. Um, so I wonder if you could, everyone could speak about that. How do you think about um, remembering the old, but also creating the new? I'd like to start on this one, if I may. Do I have my, the permission of my colleagues Please. on this one? So many of you here know me maybe from Brave Old World. Um, and it's actually been a very, very important principle for me. I believe strongly in artistic knowledge. There is such a thing as artistic knowledge. And artists who are engaged with creating new works and creating new knowledge, they have something to teach people as artists. They have ways of seeing history, ways of digesting history ways of working with history, which has a future just as much as it has a past. And I love the idea that um, from the beginning, you know, we've tried to put artists together with scholars at Yiddish Summer Weimar. So there's an ongoing dialogue um, that we can inform one another. Um, scholars make their contributions, but artists make their contributions as well. And it's also been very important to me that artistic knowledge is sort of the horse that's pulling the the, the, the wagon and not the other way around um, at Yiddish Summer Weimar. Um, and I also have very much the feeling, I've been saying this to people for years and years, that, um, I mean, Brave Old World was a, was a band. I, I feel very, very lucky to have had that experience, to kind of grown up in that environment because um, I feel that we were equal parts, uh, deep connection to history and creativity at the same time with the different people in that band. Um, and I can't imagine it any other way, actually. Um, and my experience of working with sources and working with history is, is very much that um, I will go into a historical question or into a source, and at a certain point, I find a really powerful desire in myself to do something with it, like to create something with it. And then I kind of turn my attention away from the sources and I turn my attention towards creative processes, and then it's like climbing a mountain where then I reach a certain plateau and then I'm filled with questions that the only way I can get answers to those questions is to go back to the sources again. So I go back to the sources for a while and then that pattern repeats itself and it's repeated itself. I mean, it repeats itself constantly every day, but even in larger cycles, it's repeated itself dozens of times in my creative life. And this happens in Yiddish Summer of Weimar all the time. So we're constantly connecting with not only in Yiddish Summer of Weimar, but I'm speaking just for that organization at the moment. I think all of us do this, that, that you know, we're fascinated by sources. There's something magical and, and, and like being in a time machine, being transformed by contact with new sources, but with new discoveries of older sources. Um, for me, the other Europeans was one of these projects, also the Zemmer Ensemble, which I hope, by the way, is going to come to North America, a little plug for that in uh, um, uh, September and October next year. But every time you encounter sources that you didn't know about before, there's something magical that, that opens up. But then as an artist, you're challenged to do something with that, that, that it's not enough just to know about people who lived in the past and what they did. But, but they're, they're challenging you to engage with it and to, and to take that work further and to make it personal. And I love that, uh, that little um, dialectic between those ways of knowing. Thanks. Yeah, I 100% I agree that this sort of dialectic, this dialogue between um, this balance between sort of foundational vocabulary and um, artistic knowledge and, and where we're taking it is at play in everything we do. Um, and I often say that the, this dialogue between forwards and backwards is really uh, visible at CLES Canada in, in what many people think of when they first think of CLES Canada Summer Retreat, which is our Backwards March. Many of you are familiar with our Backwards March. Um, it's a tradition um, brought to us by uh, theater maker Jenny Romain and Frank London and it's a Goddessman tradition from Romania that has been um, transformed and brought into the Clez Canada community and has now been part of our tradition for over 20 years, um, since before I started going to camp. So, um, and 
and it really encapsulates both this tension between um, source material and um, reimagined tradition, what, what, what we're making of the tradition and where we're taking it. Um, this, uh, this incredible creativity in working with uh, historical sources that in ways that feel, um, that bring something out of us in terms of our contemporary and future oriented identities. Um, and I think that uh, at least part of my approach is in, and I, and I know I'm not the only one here, but in that tradition is not a static thing, right? I mean, Living Traditions was the organization that uh, held Klez Camp, right? But, and that, uh, that tradition is not static, it's not fixed. And we tend to see outside of the Yiddish scene, we see a lot of people using the word tradition in ways that mean static or mean fixed. And I feel like we're often pushing against that as a larger community. Um, and that that is the tension um, that we're all holding, which I think is incredibly productive and exciting. Um, where, where can we take it? So at, um, at our summer retreat, it's really important to um, make sure that we're always offering foundational vocabulary, um, you know, the foundations of the form, but also teaching context and teaching methods for putting those um, aspects together in new ways. And I will say, I think we were set up for success very early in that uh, the founders of Klez Canada, right at the beginning, brought in Brave Old World, right? And brought in other artists who were already engaged in this kind of work. And it really set up our compass in terms of where we went um, in ways that I recognize every day and value. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm really passionate about this tension as well. And I think that it is, it is actually the key to almost everything we do, including our relationship with um, our younger audiences, our younger demographic, our scholarship program, making sure that we um, are listening to their voices, but also giving them tools to create with. Um, and um, critical thinking skills as well, which I, I am really invested in bringing critical thinking into the, um, into the uh, pedagogy of everything that we're doing to make sure that um, we are approaching our own culture in non-appropriative, non-violent, uh, decolonial, like all of these lenses are really important to what we're doing. Um, and should be um, part of the conversations that we're having. And, you know, as Alan talked about the German context, right? And we are also uh, in Canada and North America, I think it's important to talk about our context here through critical lenses, right? We are, um, we are settlers, we're immigrants, we're refugees onto land that wasn't ours. Um, we exist in multicultural um, communities. We exist, um, we have a history of assimilation, sometimes um, quite violent assimilation. And I think we need to recognize how all of those tensions play upon um, not only the work we're curating, but the people who are coming to their, those programs. How are they holding all of these um, tensions and anxieties within their own identity as they, um, as they learn. I think one growing way that we've all benefited from in um, continuing as you know, we're all wrestling with the depletion of the generation of folks who grew up where Yiddish was the lingua franca and, you know, life was carried out in Yiddish and these art forms were not considered Yiddish music or Yiddish theater, they were considered music and theater. That's what they had in their in their community. So we're running out of, I mean, we just lost Pete Sokolow a week ago, the wonderful uh, 
pianist here, klezmer pianist here in New York. So um, one one important thing we've we've all been benefiting from is digital archives. And Yivo has been an important part of that with the Ruth Rubin archive, with the Yiddish Song Project archive that are, is, you know, now on the, um, you know, now on the Internet. Uh, see, I, so Yiddish New York has been founded under the auspices of Center for Traditional Music and Dance, which has been, you know, working to archive and disseminate uh, important documentation of Yiddish performers for, you know, 50 years, really. Uh so we've had we've been working with it's a goddessman on the Yiddish song of the week. We have the Stonehill Jewish Song Archive, which is an archive of uh, of songs uh, collected from survivors of the Holocaust who were holed up in a hotel in uh, 1948 on the Upper West Side, and we have thousands of hours of recordings of them, and we're working on disseminating that. We have the Yiddish song. Uh, we also have Yiddish song Yiddish folk song .com which we've been working with Mark Slobin and a bunch of others um, to get up. So that's been a, a really important way where even though we're, we're running out of those who le who learned the, the tradition kind of in situ uh, before this revival happened, uh, it's, we can really continue to inherit and, and, you know, learn, understand and, and make use of, their work and build upon it through these through these wonderful digital archives. Another thing we've had the pleasure of doing is helping assisting Zeb Feldman and Christina Crowder to get the Klezmer archive going and the uh, wonderful Kisselgoff Makanovetsky Digital Manuscript Project, KMDMP, which you should all check out, which has been an amazing international effort to digitize music that was collected by Russian scholar, Russian Jewish scholars over 115 years ago, and get those manuscripts uh, back in the public sphere and in the hands of musicians around the world who are helping to digitize this music and are performing it now all over the world. I see a number of uh, folks on the um, in our audience are involved with that project too. It's but it's 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 amazing. So so we have some new a new arsenal of tools that we can use to sort of collectively continue to infuse the Yiddish cultural scene with, uh, you know, amazing, amazing documentary power and archival power to, uh, to get us to new places. Lisa, you're muted. Sorry. Um, I think true for all of us. Um, you know, the word I like to attach to all of this is possibility. You know, there's a lot has happened in the 40 years we've been around and and did the rescue and digitization. Alex, I know you're involved in the same thing there at YIVO. We're finally at a place where people have the ability to dip into the archives, to to find the source material that's been spoken about. And there's an enthusiasm for creativity. And I think of a few programs that we presented at Yidstock which were surprising and really exciting. One was Frank London's um, at night, a night in the um, marketplace, IL Parrots. And I remember Deborah Kaplan talking about this, um, saying that IL Parrots in his time when he wrote it, didn't think it could ever be staged because it was so ahead of its time. And here we were in, you know, like 2015, realizing this on stage. And to me, that was, you know, such an exciting thing to see. I think of some of the, work that's been done with translation and taking translation. And again, Alex, I'm going to toss that back to you because this is something that you do, working with translation and um, reimagining it or, you know, just going straight with it. But it's found its way into techno music. It's found its way into jazz. It's found its way into vocal collaborations and conversations between Yiddish and Sephardic. Um, it's just amazing that all of our organizations and all of the work that's been done and the teaching and the enthusiasm all has made for possibilities I don't think anybody could have imagined. Uh, and to me, that's one of the things that energizes all the work that we're collectively doing and also energizes not just the creative side of it, but again, those festival goers that they just can come and be inspired in some way. There's so much 
fascinating and important work that's happening out there that is represented by these organizations and other partners out there. Um, it's uh, it's really exciting. We could keep talking about this for a very long time, but we've passed the hour, so I want to turn to audience questions, um, and then I'll save one last question of my own for the for the the end. But if you're in the audience and you have any questions, you can drop them in the chat right now, or you could raise your virtual hand if you'd like to ask it out loud. Um, we've got a question from Merlin Shepard. What does the panel think about the overall Americanization of the way in which Jewish culture is presented worldwide? Any thoughts on Americanization of Jewish culture? <laughs> in a way, it, it depends on how you define Americanization. Um, I mean, I, I'm a klezmer musician, and I actually I play one of the oldest klezmer instruments, the cymbal, which is the hammer didn't really translate to American klezmer at all until it was revived really in the 1970s with a small revival in a, you know first in North America and then other places. So I really see the music that I've been I personally have found the most love and and uh, integrity in and personally and you know connection to has been European klezmer music stuff that was recorded in the teen you know 1910s 1915s but in a way that's a very american approach that i'm i'm sort of able to make that choice and not just sort of accept the culture that's being fed to me by the mass media but i have you know as a 21st century american jew i have the choice to kind of reach beyond that and find these strange little pockets of musical uh loveliness uh to go so it, it kind of looks Americanization could be contextualized in a number of different ways. I agree with what Pete just said about that. And um, I mean, I think in Yiddish summer of Weimar, we have been more engaging with the European context than with the American context for quite some time. But exactly what you said, Pete, I mean, I'm often comparing the ideas or let's say the basic sort of ideology of the the composers the artists in the saint petersburg school or someone like bartok with with our generation namely you know for those people going native uh, which you know the term that used to be used in anthropology was something you wanted to avoid at all costs you know and it was a very clear distinction between high culture and low culture you would go out and do the work and you might romanticize you know the 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 truth of the work that you find among the people but then you'd come back home and make compositions based on it that are that are definitely intended to be part of high culture. And at least in my generation, I think for many people in our world, um, being able to play a bar mitzvah, being able to play a wedding is, you know, your initiation into into this world. It's not to avoid it. On the contrary, you know, you 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 show your belonging to this world by being able to do that. And that has something to do with a different orientation that American anthropology had than um, early 20th century um, I, I European ideas. And so I do think that that kind of an approach towards what we might call traditional culture or folk culture, the fluidity, like validating all of the different aesthetics that there are there, which we see in the klezmer music world. I mean, there are people in the Yiddish music world who are doing things that are, that are um, you know, very kind of raw in their sound and other people who are doing things that are extremely cooked in their sound. And I think that we as a community, as a very diverse community, validate all of those different aesthetics. That's something that I really like very much. We could call that an American approach in a way, except then I have to think about the fact that Herder, who happened to have been in Weimar, one more intellectual from Weimar, um, who the Herder Church named after him, is the person responsible for the idea of the voices of nations, and who said not everything fits Aristotle's ideas of, of aesthetic. And when you hear music from a different part of culture or from a different nation or something, um, or in his case, it was poetry, you can't impose your aesthetic standards on that. You have to, you have to develop intrinsic aesthetic standards for each thing. And so that's not just an American idea to take things on their own terms. So I guess I would say that I don't really see exactly what it is that Merlin is talking about either. Maybe you'll want to elaborate it a little bit in your questions. Um, I'd like to chime in as well. Um, I think it's a great question and also very complex because, uh, because you haven't necessarily defined what you mean as, as um, 
neither Americanization nor Jewish culture. Um, in many ways, I think that um, the, this Yiddish ecosystem is not aligned with much of American Jewish culture. Um, so I think there's already sort of a bit of a disjunction there. Um, but I, maybe just to talk about CLES Canada's retreat in specifics, um, that over the years it has been really important to um, the directors um, uh, and my, my preceding directors uh, to make sure that we are bringing in um, many different voices. So for many years, uh, we had a program that we called East Meets West. This was very much a program that uh, Michael Alpert was uh, deeply involved in and, and the driver of. And I would say that East Meets, our East Meets West program, which ran for probably 10 years, um, really shifted the sound of CLES Canada. Um, and that program brought artists and scholars from, um, uh, from Eastern Europe, predominantly the former Soviet Union, to uh, CLES Canada summer retreat to uh, both to teach and participate. Um, and uh, yes, we're not the only ones who did this, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm just giving the, the context of our own retreat. Um, I think it's it really, but clearly it was a really important thing to be doing and, and remains important. We also had briefly an Israeli outreach program that brought artists from Israel. So of course, some of those were also from the former Soviet Union to um, teach at CLES Canada. Um, so making sure that we have a sort of a rotating variety of voices who are building the culture together rather than only the same set of voices is part of a way to, yes, and an open dialogue. I think that's really important and definitely part of how I'm um, thinking about uh, programming going forward, but very much building on, um, on the history of the organization. Wonderful, I wanna invite up Judy Barless has her hand raised. <clears throat> oh, sorry, I muted you accidentally, Judy. I meant to unmute you. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to speak to something that Avia brought up, which she knows is what we're doing here in DC, um, in terms of not just thinking of large events that you're traveling to, but things that are happening back home. And I, But I specifically wanted to mention it, not just in terms of, Okay, you can have you can have workshops in smaller places rather than people having to travel, but in terms of making playing the music and dancing a part of our lives, a part of our lives as Jews, a part of cultural lives of a city. Um, the example that I always use is people, you know, sit around playing bluegrass music for fun. They go to festivals and they play bluegrass music for fun. They sit on their porches. Why can't we be doing that with Yiddish music, whether as Jews or not? Um, when I started uh, up a klezmer band in uh, Southeast Michigan way back in the mid eighties, it was not so much that, yeah, I'm some big shot musician, I'm gonna play for people, but I wanted to be able to bring Yiddish music back into the lives of the communities who back then it was only, it was only, you know, Israeli stuff. If the DC Klezmer workshop people are playing for dancing, it's not as performers, it's because we get to play, people get to come and dance. And one of the things that I was thinking of with you all talking was not just thinking in terms of here are the performers and serious artists and here is the audience, but in terms of it living in a community, the kind of community that gets created and the enrichment of, of people's lives as people having having art in their lives, being able to, to do things for fun, whether it's dancing or music. And the one other thing I wanted to bring back in with that is, is in terms of of integrating more all the parts of our culture that need to be reanimate, reanimated. And that includes the Yiddish language, which 
um, an interesting thing I heard the other day, there's not a whole lot of us at DC Klezmer who are into Yiddish, but we do do a lot of work all the time, um, which is harder with in the COVID world, Howard and I trying to get people to come to the other events so that they're influenced by what's going on. And now, of course, there's Yiddish Duolingo, which is accessible, but, you know, habits has its limitations. And I was talking to someone the other day who said, yeah, she was do doing Yiddish Duolingo, but now she wants to take a real class. She had had no interest in studying Yiddish until she went to Class Canada this summer. And so it's all bouncing off each other and it's all enriching things. And I think it's something, though, that we all need to be thinking about of how can we make people make people, I, you know, it's that should word that you don't like to use, but how can you, how can we be working to make it a clearer feeling that this is all of a concept and that they animate each other and, um, and that the richness is, is together. Thank you, Judy. I see a, a bunch of, just jump in, whoever would like to respond. Go ahead, Alan. Uh, thank you. I have two contributions that I want to make to this. One is um, a, 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 the artistic director of something called the Borderlands Foundation in Saini, Poland, a, a wonderful artist himself named Krzysztof Krzyszewski, um, Krzyszewski, excuse me, um, used the term 20 years ago, the festivalization of culture, um, to criticize putting all of your resources into festivals rather than in what happens in daily life. Um, I like that a lot, and that's one of the things that I kind of an angel that I carry on my shoulder all the time. Um, remember not to festivalize culture. And the second thing I wanted to contribute, which could be interesting for those of you who don't know about this, is I think a very interesting book by a fellow named Thomas Torino. It's called Music as Social Life, the Politics of Social, the Politics of Participation. And um, Torino makes a distinction in this book between what he calls participatory modes of culture, cultural production, and performative modes of cultural production. And in participatory mode, what matters is that everybody's doing it, you know, playing music and dancing to the music. And in performative modes, you could say what matters is sort of the evaluation of preparing something, performance, how well does the performance go, how perfect is the performance, and, and what we expect from an artwork, we usually evaluate it in terms of performance a performative uh, uh, production. But what I think is really important, is I believe myself, and I think that we see kind of a crisis in culture in general, in what we might call Western European art music throughout the 20th century in this, that when the gap between performative and participatory modes of making cultural production are too great, then both sides suffer enormously from this. And, and in, in the world of Yiddish, there's all kinds of obvious reasons why the participatory level of this suffered in the in the 20th century. So actually, I really strongly believe in this in the need to work at this from both sides that I think that um, we can only create interesting artworks. I put this in in quotes for the moment. Um, if there's an audience that shares enough of the participatory culture to be able to understand what's going on in those works. And on the other hand, um, to have inspiring artworks, um, I mean, we can even think of an example of this, of how many people were drawn to um, playing klezmer music or learning something about Yiddish music just because Itzhak Perlman got involved in this, that someone who is, you know, a star in the, in the performative world attracts people and legitimizes it and makes people feel, oh, this is something worth doing, you know, on a participatory level. So I think it's important to work at both ends towards the middle. Um, healthier participatory culture makes for healthier performative culture and vice versa. Can I jump in there um, and say, so I, I love this. I, I totally agree with this tension and relationship that Alan just set up between participatory and performance. I also see um, a shift in, in, um, in the Yiddish ecosystem in general over the last, I don't know, I don't want to put a year number on it, but a shift towards um, programs that are focused on teaching leaders 
So pedagogy, pro Yiddish pedagogy programs, um, you know, I'm, as many of you know, I'm also a Yiddish dance teacher and um, a shift towards uh, teaching a new generation of leaders, a wider generation of leaders so that um, no longer, you know, so that now we're, we're seeding communities with dance leaders to like bring back that participatory culture, um, teaching pedagogical skills to musicians so that they can share um, more broadly. And I think that this is a, a trend and in programming, not a not a brand new trend, but something that we can see shift if we look at the, you know, the Yiddish cultural renaissance, that there is a period of time when we have to be focused on learning ourselves, right? I was not there at that point. But then at a certain point, we can shift towards reseeding that participatory culture, right? So, and that's part of the tension that that dynamic that Alan mentioned but also something that really is happening at an institutional level um, in terms of programming. I've been very interested to watch that happen as all of these different institutions, for, including YIVO, including the Book Center, the, you know, all of us here and beyond offer these pedagogically focused programs designed to rebuild that participatory culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I could, I, I'm reminded of something that Adrian Cooper, the late great Adrian Cooper, used to talk about uh, in these programs, which was how there is a right <laughs> when we're dealing with Yiddish. It is a language; it has its own, it has rules, and there are things you could, you know, that there is wrong Yiddish and right Yiddish, and that goes, you know, in a lot of the art forms, there are things that we kind of, as a community, have agreed. Those who are in the know have agreed upon are, you know, this is the way things you can do with the music. And there's sort of a border around that before it starts deviating into Afro-Caribbean music or blues or some other kinds of music. But Adrian used to say, you know, so there are these sort of quote unquote understand sort of rules and borderlines, but at the same time, we have to make it fun for people who are just coming in and are experimenting or just learning the music and want to feel like they can make a contribution. And uh, you, that's you. I think it's an important job of all of ours to validate those experiences. Listen, I started in klezmer music as a banjo player, certainly could be excuse, excused, uh, accused of doing Jewgrass music. And thanks to people like Merlin Shepard, who was actually my first Klez Camp ensemble teacher, along with Stephen Greenman, who didn't kick me out of the band with my band, my, the ear band with my banjo, but they invited me in. and. That led to a, you know, kind of a long, uh, many years of experimentation before I became kind of evolved and became something else. So I always listen, I always look back at what Adrian said about, and I think that's something we could work more on is being more inviting and validating to folks who are just coming in. And Judy, going, going back to what you're talking about, you know, one thing that's interesting about Klezmer, it's a functional music, but at the same time, it was a professional music. You know, you had to be good to play, a, you know, there's a whole corpus of repertoire that you have to be pretty facile on your clarinet or your trumpet or accordion or whatever to be able to perform. Um, so that's a, uh, it's, so it's, it kind of gives an interesting creative tension between the functionality of the performance and also the art artistry that's required to really pull off. I mean, there's other musics I think that are easier to start off, off in uh, than klezmer uh, you know you need you know there's a little bit of know-how to be to get to the point where you can lead a dance set or things like that so we have I, to would like to, to, I would like to add to that something that I often emphasize in in Europe where people I think are not so aware of of what I'm about to say namely that a lot of the uh, inclusivity which is so fundamental to the culture of Yiddish um, culture revi revitalization is not necessarily native to uh, Yiddish culture, in my opinion. So if you read, for example, you know, Zev Kl uh, Feldman's research um, interviews with, with Kapellmeisters and so forth, I mean, it, it's a very hierarchical, very sexist, very, there are all kinds of things about this that we definitely do not emulate in our, in our world. And, um, 
And it's very interesting, especially when there's such a high awareness these days, Avia, you mentioned the term of a cultural appropriation. And I find myself these days, if I teach Nigunim or lots of different repertoires, explaining to people why this is not um, improper for them to be learning this, even though this is not the culture that they grew up with, why, why this is really not a case of cultural appropriation, but this is, this is a case of a kind of, you know, a, asserting an entire set of values that that are, like I say, at the heart for me of the of the uh, Yiddish music revitalization and the role of women in this is first and foremost in all of that. I mean, you know, there's been a revolution of gender in Yiddish cultural practices, a revolution in in um, sort of democratic tendencies, all kinds of things like this. And I'm very, very proud of that. And I claim that for for our generation, by the way, or for at our generations, I want to say that I, I claim those changes. Well, there are some great other questions in the chat and I have other questions and we could really, there's so many fascinating topics that just came up. Um, we could talk all day, but I'm afraid we've reached our time here. So I just wanna say thank you to all of you so much for for joining us uh, this afternoon or evening or where, whatever it is for all the different time zones that everyone's joining from. Um, and also, you know, Yasha Koya, continue with strength and all of the amazing work that's happening. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you all. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, everyone in the audience. To is star Merlin still crowd. here? Where's Merlin? <laughs> Paulina, where's Merlin? Merlin is still here. Upstairs. Merlin, what do you mean by Americanization? <laughs>